Okay, this is the Civil Rights Movement <clears throat> notes section one. Well, African Americans had a long history of fighting for rights. After or after World War II, that fight only intensified further. In the South, Jim Crow laws enforced strict separation of the races. We've talked about that before. We talked about it last fall. Um, Jim Crow laws were established after the end of the Civil War. Um, and after those uh, Reconstruction Amendments were passed, if you don't remember 13, 14, and 15, go back and look at that stuff. But segregation that is imposed by the law, which we're going to talk about two different types of segregation today. Uh, segregation that's imposed by the law, in this case in the South, we're talking about Jim Crow laws. They vary from state to state, so just because it's a law in Mississippi doesn't mean it's going to be a law in Alabama. Um, those are called de jure segregation. Uh, de jure, the reason that's, or the way that I remember it anyway, that it's segregation imposed by law. Jure kind of sounds like jury, so that's your little, um, little way to remember it, I guess. Um, if you don't remember last fall when we were talking about Plessy versus Ferguson, this is the case that established the separate but equal precedent that said as long as there are separate facilities for each race and they're equal, segregation is perfectly legal. That was the law of the land, and that would be the law of the land until the Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and 60s changed that. Segregation in the South was virtually enforced everywhere in public life. So hospitals, schools, uh, transportation, even cemeteries. And then there's a second type of segregation, de facto segregation or segregation that just kind of happens it's just kind of an unwritten rule it's a custom it's tradition that's common everywhere um even still today honestly a little bit discrimination and racism are present in every area of the country that was the case then it's unfortunately still the case now sometimes um but african americans were impacted by segregation racism discrimination in every area of their life uh for the civil rights movement, and it improved it. It didn't get rid of it completely, but it obviously improved it. Um, World War II set the stage in many ways for the modern civil rights movement. Kind of mentioned that on the first slide. Roosevelt banned in 1941 discrimination in defense industries. This meant if you wanted to work, you know, building tanks for World War II, you could not be prevented from doing that job just because you were a minority. Um, so that's what that means. It doesn't mean he discriminated the, or uh, desegregated the military. That happens in 48 with Truman. So really the first war we fight with the desegregated military is the Korean War. A lot of times people think um, that it was Vietnam. It's just because people forget about the Korean War even happening, sadly. Uh, but Truman did that in 1948. It's probably his biggest accomplishment as as a president was desegregating the military. And I mentioned this the other day, but really the U.S. military it's one of the most diverse and integrated places you could work at in the United States, um, especially racially diverse. Some pictures. I, I know you've seen some of them before. Uh, I know the one in the top left you've probably seen at some point, the segregated drinking fountains. On the top row in the middle, that would be in South Texas. So it just depended on where you lived in the United States, what kind of segregation you might be exposed to, um, or what kind of discrimination you might see. So obviously in this part of Texas, the minority really was Mexican Americans and not African Americans. And then the picture right under that, the bottom row in the middle, um, that's an example of de facto segregation. So this is outside of a neighborhood, and it's not a law that you have to be a white resident to live there, but the white residents that already do are making it clear that they may not be super friendly if you're not white. <clears throat> By the end of World War II, the NAACP was the largest and most powerful 
It was one of the largest, most powerful civil rights organizations in the United States. We've talked about the NAACP before. If you don't remember the acronym, it's National uh, or National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It attracted both black and white lawyers, um, such as Thurgood Marshall. And it's a picture of him down there in the bottom right. Um, they won several key cases in the 50s before we get to the big one on the next slide. McLaurin versus the Oklahoma State Regents. Uh, McLaurin was a student that had been admitted to OU, uh, but at the same time that he was admitted, he also wasn't allowed to go in the classroom at the same time as his white classmates. So this court case that they won, uh, the NAACP did, gave him access to everything he needed to actually be able to get a degree and not just be admitted to the University of Oklahoma. Not long after those first few cases <clears throat> challenging segregation and education, um, the NAACP took on a much lar a larger and broader case, and it wouldn't just impact uh, education. It impacted the way segregation was looked at in all public facilities, public life, fill in the blank. In Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, or Brown v. Board, NAACP challenged the separate but equal principle, which had been established by Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Um, so that, like I said, law of the land for 50, 60 years now. Supreme Court actually agreed with the NAACP's argument that segregated public education violated the U.S. Constitution. I put a video on Google Classroom that talks about this some more. Make sure you go watch that. The Brown decision was unanimous. That was a big deal, but it wasn't a split decision that all nine justices agreed uh, and that the newly appointed chief justice agreed and wrote, um, wrote the decision. And this is not obviously the whole decision. I just put a little uh, excerpt on here. There's more of it in the video that you'll get to hear. It says, in the field of public education, the doctrine or the idea of separate but equal has no place. Uh, separate he said, was inherently unequal. So that decision became the new precedent. It overturned Plessy versus Ferguson, which said separate but equal could be okay, and other cases, other lawyers, other civil rights, you know, uh, discrepancies, now when they took those to court, they could quote and look at and draw back to Brown versus Board and say, if it's if separate but equal is against the law here, it should be against the law here, because the Supreme Court says separate is inherently unequal. So that, like I said, really was a huge win for the civil rights movement and the NAACP. The last thing I've got on this slide, and we've talked about this before, is the KKK. Um, they've been around. If you don't remember us going over it in the fall, they've been around since the end of the Civil War and they are still around today, and they've just had periods where they're really active and have high membership, and then there's periods where they're not very active and there's kind of low membership. So the Brown decision uh, coincided with much more active KKK and a, and a higher membership and higher visibility. Um, Historically, education had been a state matter, but the Brown decision now made it a federal matter. Local and state governments resisted desegregation, and, and really it did take, the schools didn't desegregate overnight after the Brown decision came out. Um, it took decades to, to really desegregate schools uh, with any meaning. Um, but the most famous intervention or, or, or clash, I guess we'll say, between the federal government and the state's governments and local governments came in Little Rock with the Little Rock Nine. I showed you a video about this last week or a little clip from it. But nine African-American students volunteered to be the first to enroll at Central High School. I say that. They, they did volunteer. They were also chosen. Um, they, they were vetted. They were people that chose them, made sure they could handle doing something like this and and again this was not this was not these kids even though they were kids it was not their first um foray into into being a civil rights activist uh but anyway they get to enroll um 
the Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus announced he was not going to allow integration of Central High School, and he ordered the Arkansas State National Guard to block their entrance. Um, I mean, you could have saw that in the video. Up to this point, Eisenhower hadn't done much in, in regards to civil rights, but seeing what happened to the kids in Arkansas, because that was on the news, he decided he had to do something. Um, the something he decided on um, was to send in the Arca or to send in the 101st Airborne, excuse me, and he. Uh, he could have just federalized the Arkansas State National Guard, uh, but he chose instead to send in the 101st, which is, if you don't remember, uh, an incredibly famous unit from, from World War II, you know, the paratroopers that jumped in the night before D-Day and were in the Battle of the Bulge, and, and yeah. Um, send them in to escort these kids to class, and they stayed the whole year and, and made sure that they got to go. Didn't protect them from being harassed, you know, completely, but a lot to at least go in the building and, and go to class. So, some pictures from that. You've seen the one in the top left. Uh, the one right under that is the some of the members of Little Rock 9 getting to go to class. It's the 101st protecting them. And then um, Ernest Green, the picture in the bottom right, is the first African-American student to graduate from High school. Rosa Parks, um, there are some misunderstandings about, about Rosa Parks and, and what she, uh, what her history was before the Montgomery bus boycott, before all of that. She uh, was a civil rights activist. Uh, her being arrested was not her first, like I said, uh, won her first rodeo in the civil rights arena. Uh, and she also did not sit at the front of the bus. That's a common misconception. She sat in her section, but the law has also said that if a white passenger asked for your seat, regardless of what section you know you were in, you had to you had to give it. And she didn't, and that's why she was arrested. That led to the Montgomery bus boycott. It lasted over a year. And then the Supreme Court ruled that segregated uh, public transportation was unconstitutional. Um, you add to that Martin Luther King, uh, the, the day after the boycott is organized, gives this inspirational speech and, and encourages protesting in a nonviolent way. And so they do. They do that for over a year by just not taking the city buses and winning. And it made it very clear that nonviolence and nonviolent protests would result in wins as long as you did it that way. And so that kind of leads to him being the real leader of the civil rights movement, especially in the beginning. We'll talk about some other leaders for the civil rights movement later on. But um, that kind of wraps up our first section. Uh, the next slide here has your questions on it that are in your note-taking guide. Make sure you answer those. Um, check out the videos I put on Classroom that go with this section of notes. Um, and if you have any questions, obviously you know how to get a hold of me. And we'll see you for the section.